I'm Bill Brown with Brookings Mountain West. I have the pleasure of welcoming you and, and kicking off today's uh, program, which we're very excited about. Let me thank a few people first, including our own Caitlin Saladino, Ryan Thorpe, and our colleagues here at Greenspun College. Uh, due to some technical difficulties, we weren't sure we were even going to be in this room having this event here until a few hours ago. So we are even happier than we usually are to be here in our <laughs> home away from home. Uh, we have a printed agenda, which I hope you picked up, or we, or we can get you one now or on the way out, uh, with a lot of details. We, we're not big on long biographical lectures here. We want to get to the meat of the day. Uh, so we'll, we'll bring our speakers up pretty promptly and get on with our program. The, there'll be three presentations, and then we'll bring all the speakers up for a a Q&A, uh, so you'll have a chance to react to what you heard, ask some questions, give us your thoughts as we <coughs> launch Las Vegas in the middle class here at Brookings Mountain West. This is a project which actually grew out of an announcement from our colleagues at the Brookings Institution about a couple national initiatives that they're undertaking related to this, and you'll actually hear about them from our speakers today. I will try not to steal too much of their thunder. You might notice uh, the image we chose for the cover of our agenda. I'm not sure this might be the first conference on Las Vegas where the cover does not include an image of the strip or the Las Vegas <laughs> sign. <laughs> that's, that's a slight exaggeration, and I can assure you there are ones on the inside of the agenda and <laughs> will be all over the website. I make that point just to say that, of course, not that the strip is not important. It is the economic and recreational engine for not just the middle class, but our whole region. But the fact that there are 2.2 million people around that strip who live and work here every day. I'm talking <laughs> to many of them right now. So that's who we're going to focus on uh, with uh, what we hope to be a number of innovative and deep dives uh, into who is the middle class, who's in it, who's not, et cetera. You'll hear all about this from my colleagues, Rob Lang, Camille Bousset, and Richard Reeves. Let me just one more piece of, of homework. We've launched uh, the, the uh, Las Vegas and Middle Class website on our Brookings Mountain website. You see the, the rather long URL up above, but if you just type in Brookings Mountain West, it'll take you to our homepage. You can click on Las Vegas and the Middle Class and keep up with everything we're doing there. Also, you can send us your email, follow us on social media, of course, hear more about all that we're doing. Before we leave here today, the PowerPoints that you see will be up on this website in a few days. Again, thanks to our colleagues, the video of this event will be up on the website. We already have a few related publications and links up there relating to Las Vegas and the middle class. So there's going to be a lot of information presented today. Do not hurt yourselves trying to jot down every number and image. It'll be available to you uh, when you need it. So I think I've covered everything I need to. Let me bring up Rob Lang to get us started. Okay, I'm up first, and my role here is to set a kind of context for understanding the, uh, the middle class in Las Vegas. And, you know, one of the key points here is that there's lots of things that would restrain mobility in this region, uh, but our demographic composition and our spatial form is not one of them, and I'll show that uh, in my talk, that in fact Las Vegas is structured in a way, spatially, and has diversity that penetrates to the sort of neighborhood level and provides proximity to work and to social contexts that are, you know, not just concentrated poverty, that it ends up being something that's positive for the region. You know, we may not be doing all we can. Certainly we're not on K through 12. Hopefully this university's doing all it can. I'm a faculty member here. Uh, but, you know, the, the mobility issues in Las Vegas are not tied to spatial form. And our colleagues are looking at other regions around the U.S notably Charlotte, that's a place where the actual physical layout of Charlotte itself 
constitutes a form of inequality uh, because it puts uh, people at great distance to employment, for example, and to services. So here's who I am. My bio is in the, uh, the, the sheet that's uh, out front. That's the agenda. And uh, what's in the talk? Well, I look at the characteristics of the people in place. And then I end with an invitation to the UNLV faculty here to participate with us on this project. So what's nice is Brookings is putting a lot into this project. And they're going to have all of the sort of parameters and definitions of what constitutes the middle class at the core of the project. And, and all of their analysis can be joined by us and using the same methods and the same definitions uh, you know, we can, we can help build, for Las Vegas in particular, the amount of work that's dedicated to this important topic. So I encourage everybody to, and at the end I'll say where I think we can interface, but to consider that, consider doing a, a couple of research projects with us on this. Uh, to start with just, you know, where is Las Vegas in terms of all the major urban clusters? This is something that we've worked on over the course of this decade, which is that Las Vegas is part of a southwest urban cluster, and it matters because we exchange not just, you know, sort of tourists with Southern California, but I think as this last election proved, and the fact that, you know, the, some of the folks in the election were worried about us becoming East California. <laughs> Note to the political class, we are East California. <laughs> and, you know, people come from these other regions like the Sun Corridor, which is what we call Phoenix, Tucson, and Southern California. They come with high skills, edu education credentials from the state that has put more investment in uh, you know, higher ed than we have, and they bring, they bring all kinds of assets with them as well. And they buy our housing, and our housing is in some ways supported by the fact that Southern California and Phoenix are proximate to us, and Southern California in particular has higher costs. And when people sell houses in Southern California, they build wealth in Southern Nevada because they transfer those assets to our region. So a lot of our middle class is actually <coughs> a middle class that began in other parts of the U.S and notably Southern California as the single largest share contributor to that because of its scale, proximity, and history of connectivity with Las Vegas. And we have all kinds of data that shows this. In fact, at the Urban Affairs Association meeting, which is in Los Angeles in the spring, Jay Wan, who couldn't be here today, one of my colleagues, and I and Karen are showing uh, a whole analysis of the connectivity between the regions. So I want to start with uh, a, a discussion on urban sprawl. I've been part of a team of scholars for the last two decades that have been looking at the characteristics of sprawl. And one of my colleagues at the University of Utah, Reed Ewing, took the trouble of creating a, com a composite index out of all of the sort of multiple ways you can look at sprawl, like density or mixed uses or street accessibility. And so he's actually sort of done us all a favor because he put it into a singular index and then gave a score to it and creates weights. And as you know, this is quite a transparent document. He describes his methods. You may agree or disagree with it, but it's a great way to have a sort of thumbnail sketch of, of urban sprawl. And Las, Ve Las Vegas is actually fairly high density. We have mountain surroundings with slopes, so it's hard to build. We have federal land holdings, which do not permit us to build on, except for the share that they have already allocated to us in the disposal area that is part of an agreement that goes back to 1998 to take some of that land and transfer it into the private realm. But it's actually fairly limited. And so, you know, we are actually pretty dense. You might have a lot of single family housing and it might be detached, but the lots are rather small. And so the actual physical space that this region consumes, considering it's 2.2 uh, million people in the county, about 2.15 lives in one valley. And, uh, that, and that's the valley we're in right here. And the fringes of this valley are constrained on one side by a lake. We also have, a, and by mountains on the other two sides or three sides, we also have an issue of aridity, which is to say we can't build a kind of you know, sprawling metropolis like they do in the southeast because we don't have well water. Either you're on city water or you're not. And it's expensive to br bring city water in from the lake. And the pipes and the plumbing, all, if to the further they extend, the more costly it is. So there's a constraint on the actual sort of physical dimensions to this region. It's something that I think is, is positive for us. It's not virtue on our part. We'd sprawl the hell out of the place. <laughs> we just can't. You know, for obvious, first off, you're in trouble with the federal government, you know, and, and so on. The other thing is, 
We have a lot of mixture of land uses, which I'll discuss in a second, tied to the development practices that have been common for master plan communities. And we also have centering, and one of the dimensions of centering is, where is your main employment center? Like in Chicago, it's the Loop, in New York, it's Manhattan, and so on. We have one of the most centered employment areas in the United States because we have a strip that's about four miles long and about a mile wide, and it's got the largest share of employment in the region by far, and most of the region's population is fairly proximate to that strip itself. And there's a lot of public transportation to the strip, not in the form of mass transit, which I'd prefer, but there's plenty of buses and paratransit and things like that. So it's accessible. If you have to work to in a hotel to clean it, if you have to work in a hotel in a casino, if you have to work in support, if you do the gardening there, you can get to it. So those are positive kind of things for Las Vegas. And here's an index score just to give you a sample of places <coughs> around the country. The West in general is pretty high. Phoenix really loses. Phoenix is fairly compact. It's not as compact as this region, but its main employment areas are all suburban, like Scottsdale. And it has problems of mixture of land uses as well. It has much greater residential segregation from things like retail and from especially uh, there's a pretty strong hierarchy of space in Phoenix where multifamily housing is nowhere near single family housing as is more common in Las Vegas. One of the reasons it's common in Las Vegas is we don't have the land to do it otherwise. And in Phoenix, they do have the land to do it otherwise. But when you look at the difference to the West and you see a, you know, Houston which ties Phoenix, but you look at Atlanta and this is out of 100. So 100 is midpoint. So Vegas is really 121. So it's about 20% above the, the score index of the median. You look at the southeast, the worst part of the country for this index. And Atlanta, Charlotte, Nashville are all at the very bottom. They are big, sprawling, greenhouse belching messes of metropolises. <laughs> and we are, by the way, in terms of environmental impact, a much more sustainable region. But again, not virtue. It's just something that structurally came our way. So why does density matter? Well, compactness also translates into economic productivity, job growth, GDP output. One of my colleagues at the uh, University of Arizona, Chris Nelson, did an estimate and found that for every 10% increase above the median, and we're twice that, you have about a 1% increase in regional GDP. In Las Vegas, we have just over $100 billion a year in regional output. So, you know, it's a rough translation to about $2 billion of that output's attributable to the metropolitan form. And if you're talking middle class and opportunity, it sure is better to be in a region that's structured in a way that produces not just access to opportunity because it's spatially laid out in a way that favors you to have shorter commutes with less cost, but also the physical form itself is highly efficient and producing more output in general. And then I want to turn now to the diversity, to the people side of the equation. This is a look at 2060. This comes from one of our colleagues at the Brookings Institution, Bill Fry, who is the leading demographer that chronicles the, the constant churning and evolution towards uh, majority minority status within the U.S. and is a, you know, author of two books now on the diversity explosion, as he terms it. And so Bill always has great data on this. Every, every one of us in Brookings uses Bill's data on this stuff. And if you look 20, 2060 to, to 2012, which is when this chart came from, you're looking at a drop from almost two-thirds of non-Hispanic whites to 43%. And you see also that there is a, you know, a growth not just in Latinos and African Americans, Asian population, and two or more races. The thought is among demographers that the two or more races will be a much larger share of the population than is currently projected. And that's because over the course of this decade, that figure is accelerated. So if you look at Las Vegas, outside of Hawaii and New Mexico, which began as states with non-majority white populations, you know, they began as heterogeneous from the beginning, Las Vegas is just behind them in terms of the number of non-Hispanic white marriage outside of that group. In other words, that we have the most, uh, the highest number of people, and I think you can even see it on this campus, who are forming households and having children with multiple racial backgrounds. So the data on this right now, people are projecting out of our current categories. I think by 2045, which I put up here because it's the tipping point, it's at exactly 50% majority minority status. 
I think at that point, some of these categories will have been exploded by the 2030 census, the 2040 census, because they, they don't make any sense anymore. You know, they used to count Europeans all separately, too. And then one day, in the middle of the 20th century, they realized the Europeans are no longer just Polish or Italian or Russian, Irish. They're all intermarrying to an extent that there's no way to categorize that anymore. I suspect by the mid-21st century, there'll be such frequency of marriage across races that there'll be a point at which the census can give you sort of proclivities or percentages, but can't delineate as cleanly as it once did in the early 21st century into racial categories. And you know, I think that's something actually pretty positive. Uh, and then just by state, you know, you can see Nevada in 2016 was just below majority minority. This region's majority minority. Our younger population is certainly majority minority. The lower third of the U.S. or half of the U.S. by 2060 is majority minority. You're really looking at the upper Midwest and, no, you know, of course, Maine, you know. Anyone's <laughs> been to Maine. It's because nobody's moving to Maine and no one's living in Maine, you know. So, uh, but the majority of the U.S., certainly all the Sun Belt, you know, outside of a few exceptions, is majority minority. Uh, and, you know, Las Vegas today, what's interesting is America 2060 is a great place to start the discussion on diversity because if you want to know what America 2060 looks like, it's actually Las Vegas right now because our region matches the approximate projected shares by percentage of each racial and ethnic category out past the mid 21st century. And you see it in this university. UNLV, according to US News and World Report, is the most diverse, tied with Rutgers Newark, is the most diverse national university. And that means the 300 plus PhD granting universities. There are state colleges that might be more diverse. There are community colleges that might be more diverse. But among the 300 plus doctoral granting institutions in the US, which includes you know, all of the major universities you can think of that are in division one sports and so on, the, the two ties are you know, UNLV and Rutgers Newark, I suspect in time, will pass uh, Rutgers Newark in this statistic. Now, I want to turn to uh, a series of maps that colleagues of mine, I used to be at Virginia Tech prior to being here, at the University of Virginia, which I actually knew the, the folks that did this and encouraged them to do it, did an analysis where they found uh, you know, population by racial category and represented it in a, in a single dot as far as the majority in that one census tract and produced these wonderful maps that showed you know, what a mosaic the United States is. They have national maps. They still have a lot of this stuff up on the website. The uh, Washington Post loved this stuff and reproduced it. And this map's actually, the Washington Post kind of improved on the graphics as sort of weak as these graphics are. Part of it's an artifact of the analysis. When you see Vegas, it's gonna look a little washed out. It's because it's not vibrantly segregated into enormously disparate racial blocks that it's that way, unlike, say, Chicago. So Chicago is representing, say, the Midwest. You see uh, the red here is white, north of, the, north of the downtown on the lake versus south of downtown, that there's a clean color line in Chicago. And part of that is that you know, older parts of the United States developed early 19th century, early 20th century, when racial covenants were permissible. And it was struck down in the mid 20th century by the Supreme Court. And then finally, with the passage in 1968 of the Fair Housing Act and the enforcement uh, and some of the enforcement tools of the Fair Housing Act, which you know, put teeth in it, you see that post-1968 America looks different than pre-1968 America. Well, a lot of the mis Midwest is pre-1968 America. And so even though these lines are no longer legally enforceable, they represent historical patterns that have replicated nonetheless, and you still see large blocks of difference. And you see, uh, by the way, uh, you know, uh, a kind of more than neighborhood scale. In other words, at the neighborhood level, you have large sort of monolithic dominance by individual races, whereas you know, maybe in other places that's not true. But it's also true Chicago, like Washington, has a pretty clear racial line. It's actually down 16th Street. That was west of 16th Street was whites only. East of 16th Street was not restricted. And so a lot of the region, and you see it follow out into the suburbs, Prince George's County, Maryland has a very large and middle class mostly African American community. The west part of the region from you know, northern Virginia to Montgomery County, Maryland is whiter or more Asian now. 
And so Washington, D.C. looks like another version of Chicago, which looks like another version of Cleveland or Milwaukee. The starkest color line in the United States is actually uh, Detroit, Eight Mile Road. So the north of that is white and south of that is African American. And then here's our region. And again, the lighting here sort of slightly throws off the, the vibrancy of this. You see that there is, there are to the west part of the city and the southern part of the city, whites at the fringe, like in Summerlin and in, uh, you know, in parts of Henderson. But what you see is that the majority of people in our valley live in the parts of the valley where you have mostly mi mixed race at the neighborhood scale, where you know, the dots are the different colors and they're proximate to one another. And if, you know, I'll just go back one second now that the lights are dimmed slightly. Look at Washington, D.C. Look at the whites in what's called Ward 1 of Washington, D.C. And then, you know, look at Chicago. My God, there are enormous, nearly monolithic blocks of separate population. You look at Chicago, Washington, it's a little bit more muted. Uh, the center of Washington is a little bit more muted. And then you look at Las Vegas. And by the way, Orlando looks like this. And a lot of the Sun Belt looks like this. When they first did the uh, pattern here, there are cities like Norfolk that look better than average because they had the military in them. And the military from the mid-20th century forward uh, has been integrated. And so, you know, the Navy, which is dominant there, the diversity that's reflected in, you know, who's in the Navy and the fact that it's based, you know, that your hierarchy is based on your rank you achieve, not on the race to which you've been ascribed, you know, uh, means that it carries over into the neighborhoods. In the case of Las Vegas, again, this is another instance where it's not our virtue. It's that the region developed past a point when you had, uh, you know, legally enforceable mechanisms that prevented large concentrations of singular racial blocks in development. And uh, the reasons for the contrast with the Midwest, again, 68 Housing Act. Also, our style of master plan community development actually mixes income and land uses. And part of that is, and people who live in master plans know this, at the center of master plan communities may be larger single family detached dwellings. But as you go to the main arterial roads, you get a buffer of multifamily housing that's immediately mixed in and then at the arterial roads proper, you have retail. So there's a pattern of development and whole big chunks of, of Southern Nevada have been built in a form dominated, most of Henderson is master plan communities. So the, you, know, the, uh, you know, the second largest city in the region by population, the second largest in the state of Nevada as well, has been built mostly in a way where there's been an emphasis placed on, you know, not mixing income because, again, this is some sort of super progressive place and people wanted to do it. It's that the housing types made sense where there was exclusivity in the center of the master plan to a kind of larger, you know, single family home, still on a relatively modest sized lot because of land constraints. Then you went out to a mixed income product, a mixed, uh, you know, uh, 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 I should say multi-tenanted, you know, attached apartment dwelling, you know, multifamily housing, and then finally out to retail. And I show this, this is the Oasis Sierra Apartments. These are modest two bedroom apartments and not far from this are some of the, you know, sort of more expensive six, seven, eight hundred thousand dollar homes that you find on the west side of the city. Just in contrast, you know, I'm, I, my accent may speak to this, but I'm from New York and New Jersey originally, in the garden state of New Jersey. To get an apartment like this near a single family house, somebody had to sue the state and win two rulings, Mount Laurel one and Mount Laurel two. When I was in grad school, Rutgers University was responsible for coming up with your proposed allocation of uh, multifamily housing for these towns that had exclusive all, there are towns in New Jersey where 100% of the housing stock is single family detached and they zoned it that way and the zoning itself was preventing any form of mixed income development because it excluded multifamily housing. Somebody wanted access to better schools in the suburbs and she claimed discrimination on that basis and she won two court cases in the New Jersey State Supreme Court. In, while this is going on in Jersey, they're just building this stuff in Vegas. Why? Market, market means land constraint and practice. It just happened to make sense. Now, why is this important? What does this matter for class? Well, 
What we know from the research and, and its led programs like the HUD Hope 6 project is that it's better to have mixed income uh, projects and, and land uses uh, than it is to have these monolithic blocks like you see in Chicago. In fact, the Gautreaux program in Chicago uh, was an effort to break up some of the South Side's, you know, monolithically African-American neighborhoods. And so this idea is that it helps lift people because your networks become more enriched by being in these neighborhoods, you're more proximate to, to jobs. There are regions in this country where most of the employment is at great physical distance from the majority of low-income and minority households. And to do that means that the, the burden in time and transportation costs is an additional impediment towards advancing to the middle class. And again, happy to report, we may have problems in Vegas, and we have plenty, and we've cataloged many of them in this room, but it's not that we're built in a way, that our mix of people and place is something that does not restrain our development. Now, what we can conclude is that we have this densely built form. It's good for economic development and for uh, economic output. We're diverse, and we're not just diverse where we say we have these mixes of folks that look like America 2060. They're probably living closer to where they'll live in America 2060 in that they're not segregated by neighborhood. They're next to one another. And if you're next to one another, you benefit from one another's networks. If you're next to one another, you marry people who you're next to, you become familiar with them, you, you don't buy all the sort of craziness about, oh my God, you know, people who are different than me are somehow scary, which has been some of the politics of this country as of late. And that the, there's a relationship between this density and diversity as well, that the mixture of the, the region's land uses which has, you know, pr which has provided access, which has provided opportunity, you know, also relate to the fact that the region had to be built fairly densely. It's a phoenix as a contrast. And then finally, UNLV, I encourage the, the faculty here to, to partner with us. We're going to put a lot of resources into this thing. All kinds of topics like social capital and health and education and higher ed and K through 12. So you're going to get a social capital talk and a higher ed talk today on this. But things like workforce, transportation equity, all of that matters in this project because all of these are discrete inputs into a big total picture where the, the project will be enriched by the amount of social science we can bring to bear on this. And I'll turn it over now to the social capital discussion, just a final note on this. 20 years ago, I was at Fannie Mae and we were working to bring the idea, the concept of social capital. We brought Robert Putnam in and did a journal on it. We did a large conference in DC on it that looked at social capital and, and familiarized the concept to housing and community development. And I'm happy to see that that uh, research thread continues to this day. And I thank you for your time. I want to start off by just thanking uh, Brookings Mountain West, Lindsay Institute, for having me here today. Um, I'm absolutely thrilled to be here and really, really excited about the possibility of working with my colleagues here uh, on projects that have to do not only with the future of the middle class, but also in general around generating mobility enhancing social capital. So um, I'm going to start off by giving you a little bit of a personal perspective on um, social networks. So I am a first generation American. My uh, father was from Trinidad and my mother from the Dominican Republic. And their two personal stories around social networks are really different and led to really different uh, um, professional outcomes for them. So let me start off with my mom. So my mom grew up in the Bronx uh, during the Depression one of five kids. Her father uh, worked uh, three different jobs. Her mother did not work. Um, but she went on to get a BA at Hunter College in New York City and then uh, all but dissertation at NYU and then went on to do additional coursework in international affairs um, also at NYU. And uh, because she was black, Latina, immigrant, and a woman, 
the only uh, kinds of career opportunities that were open to her were social work. So she went into social work uh, because she spoke Spanish and it was a, that was where people with her profile went. Um, she eventually got married, had kids, dropped out of the workforce for a really long, long time, uh, and then went back into the workforce as a uh, teacher for special ed kids. So my dad, on the other hand, came from Trinidad in his 20s, um, was sponsored by an uncle who had been here for many years, and uh, he came with the aspiration of being a pop singer, like Johnny Mathis. Um, and this actually ends well. Um, <laughs> and his uncle was like, I'm sponsoring you, you're going to go to college and you're going to get a job. So he did that, he worked as a stock boy in Macy's and he went to Brooklyn College. And while he was at Brooklyn College, he uh, ended up getting, uh, um, getting, developing a real interest in Spanish language and literature and uh, got very close to a professor of his who was a Sephardic Jew from Spain. And uh, so my dad uh, eventually wanted to pursue uh, Spanish language and literature uh, at the graduate level. And this particular professor took him under his wing and said, you know, I think you can actually get a PhD, but look, here's the problem. You're black. And they're just, this is the late 1950s, early 1960s. You are not going to be able to go to a lot of different institutions who just don't accept black people for PhD programs. But let me look around in my network and figure out where would be a good place to go. So the background to that is that Jews had been very recently discriminated against in the educational system, particularly in higher learning. And so through their network, they knew the places that could accept people who were discriminated against at, in, in larger, um, more reputable and higher, more highly regarded in, uh, institutions of higher learning. So through that particular association, my dad ended up applying to um, USC and getting in there. Um, and then he uh, got, his got his doctorate there and then leveraged that professor's network again to get started as an academic and he ended his career as an academic. So those two really contrasting stories about you know, how you plug into social networks and how doing so can actually really create um, differences in your economic success. And the, you know, the sort of uh, bottom line of that is that um, in one generation, right, this, you know, my dad went from being a country boy in Trinidad to being a uh, professor at, you know, a major university. Um, just really quickly, and in my mom's case, she happened to be married to him, so that was good, but um, had she been on her own, she probably would not have been as successful, just given the fact that her social networks did not extend in a way that really supported her ambitions. So let me uh, turn from that and talk about why are we talking about social networks? Well, um, the first thing is that uh, you know, clearly there's been a lot of work done over a variety of different years on social capital. But what I'm really interested in is not only that we discuss social capital, but that social capital has a reason. And the reason is that it helps enhance uh, economic mobility. So we want to understand social capital because we want to understand its role in economic mobility. The second question that I'm very interested in is how do you develop policy which is intentionally focused on creating and enhancing uh, mobility, mobility enhancing social networks? So how do you do that? So those are the two questions that are gonna anchor this talk. So let's start off um, talking, just kind of anchoring everybody. Um, so the first thing is that uh, economic mobility and economic success appear to be linked to um, social networks, uh, but economic mobility and economic success have very distinct racial and geographical components in the U.S. So let's just look at this one, this particular slide here. Just really going over it very quickly, I just want to anchor everybody, right? So this is median household income by race and Hispanic origin. 
1985 to 2016, it's longitudinal. Um, on the y-axis, you have median household income. On the x-axis, you have years. And what you're going to be able to see from this is that, um, in general, uh, whites tend to do better than Hispanics and blacks and have done so over time, and that the gap in real median um, household income really hasn't changed that much. Asians is a special category, has to do a lot with H-1B and professional status, so we're not going to talk about that. But I just want you to know, that look at the, the trajectory and the gap. Okay, so that's the first thing. Um, the second thing is, if we look at median household income by race and ethnicity, just as point in time, so this is 2016, um, you're going to see, again, sort of real big disparities. Uh, so obviously, you know, this shows uh, whites at 63,200, um, and you'll see Hispanics and blacks considerably lower, and certainly um, American Indians are, again, very, very low. And then Asians, a special category, we won't talk about that here, but um, you'll notice that there's just a big racial gap here in uh, median household income. So let's talk a little bit about Las Vegas. Um, so in general, where does Las Vegas show up compared to U.S. median household income? This is just to anchor our discussion about this particular region. So it's about you know five thousand dollars less per annum um, in general. And um, one of the interesting things about Las Vegas is that uh, over time, so since prior to two thousand. Um, not only is median income a little lower than the rest of the U.S., but you also will see here, based on this information, that the poverty rate, that the ra number of people in poverty, in Clark County in spe specifically, um, has been going up pretty steadily. Okay? Um, and obviously we had a bit of a recession in 2008, 2007, 2008. Etc. Um, and it, you know, there was a there. It, it definitely went up there. But you'll see, just in general, the trend is increasing. So let's talk a little bit about uh, the population of those with a poverty status in Las Vegas. And the reason I want to talk about this is that when we talk about economic mobility, um, we are talking about economic mobility for people who are in this status and trying to move up into the middle class and beyond. Right? So what you're going to see here is, um, this is from the US Census. So what you're going to see is the deeper colors um, indicate that you have larger concentrations of poverty. So uh, for those of you who are familiar with Clark County um, and Las Vegas in general, you're going to notice that obviously there are big concentrations in the uh, northeast and um, in the southwest and the southeast, and a little bit in the northeast, right? Um, and it's distributed around, but the big, the big red blocks are sort of in those areas. If we look at this, um, so this is a population of Hispanic or Latino origin in Las Vegas. Um, and the reason I picked this is that we have a large Latino population here. Um, we're going to see that there's some overlap between this and the poverty map before, some overlap. So northeast, um, southwest, southeast, not in the northeast, which you saw in the poverty map, and that tends to be all African American. Is that correct? Yeah, OK. So uh, what's interesting about these two maps um, is that there are people who are living in really high poverty neighborhoods, right? High, lots of high poverty neighborhoods, lots of high poverty neighborhoods that are also Latino. This is uh, a description of food insecurity um, in Clark County. And the darker, uh, the red is more food insecurity, larger po population. Um, experiencing food insecurity, the green is the least amount. So what you'll see here is that there's some overlap between the uh, last two heat maps and um, food insecurity. So you'll see in the northeast, um, this doesn't look at the southwest as much, but there is quite a bit there. Um, and you'll see there is some overlap 
between these. So the reason I bring this up is that um, if, you know, the, the chance of being, um, so if you have a profile where you are living in a poor neighborhood, you are Latino, and you're also food insecure, right, your chances of becoming economically mobile are probably very significantly diminished, right? So we want to think about people who are sort of in those categories and how is it that they become more economically mobile and what is the link between their situation and um, uh, social capital. So let's move on to social networks. So, um, in general, what are social networks? So there are links among individuals and between individuals um, that in a lot of social science literature is for reciprocity, for community advocacy, et cetera. I'm going to think about that and, and define it in such a way that social networks really lead to jumps in economic mobility. So that's, those are the kinds of social networks that I'm interested in, ones that have a, an end result of enhancing economic mobility. So one of the interesting things about the literature on social net networks and social capital is that there are a variety of different ways of thinking about how to measure it. Um, and I'm going to make a couple of claims here and free to discuss. I'm happy to discuss it as we uh, go into the panel discussion. But one of the, the more conventional ways of thinking about social capital and social networks is to think about neighborhood associations and civic organizations and churches, et cetera. Um, and I'm going to make a comment about that, but after I kind of walk you through this work. So this work was done for New York City by um, uh, Mimi Abramovitz and her uh, co-authors. And what these folks have done is they've created something called a community loss index, which is a little bit different from social networks, but it's relevant. And what they've tried to do is measure uh, community and social loss in particular zip codes. So what they've done here is, I'm going to kind of walk you through the slide. So they've taken these zip codes. This is, um, the, this is uh, Bron Harlem and the Bronx. And um, they have measured foster care, number of people who are in foster care, uh, um, emergency hospitalizations, incarceration. Uh, untimely deaths, unemployment, and foreclosures. This was done in 2012 or 2013. So what you see is um, each of these little bars uh, represents those types of events. And you'll see that in each of these um, zip codes, these uh, events are actually pretty high. They're really relatively high, and there seem to be a lot of them per zip code. So what is the relevance of this to social networks? So if you think about foster care, hospitalization, incarceration, untimely deaths, and unemployment, when you think about way social networks work, which are typically links among peers, adult peers, that help uh, generate advantage for the younger generation, what you're going to see here is that due to these kinds of events, these, these loss events, that you are missing a lot of links in that chain. A lot of generational links, a lot of intergenerational links. So one thing to think about when we're thinking about social capital and specifically mobility enhancing social capital, capital is what is the importance of generational intra- and intergenerational links. So if we look at, this is the same study, um, Flushing, Queens, same sorts of events. You notice the bars are a lot lower, right? So here, um, it's pretty clear that you don't have as many missing links intragenerationally and intergenerationally. So this is an interesting way to think about social capital, and it's something that isn't capture generally when we think about the more conventional ways of measuring social capital. So this is the more conventional way of, of measuring social capital. This is from the Penn State Index. Um, so basically, what these folks have done is they've, they've counted up, um, you know, number of, of associations, political, um, civic, uh, religious, th those sorts of things. 
Um, and what they've done is then kind of put that across the map of US. And their general findings, just to sum up really quickly, what you can see here is that you get um, much more uh, intense social capital um, in the Midwest, the you know, far Northwest, um, and then in spots around the rest of the country. But in general, you see where Las Vegas is, it's not particularly high in social capital by this measure. So another way of thinking about social capital, um, again, has to do with peer intergenerational and intragenerational networks. So this is from the Annie E. Casey Foundation. Um, this is their 2018 Kids Counts profile. This is really mostly about kids and families. But if you look at, this is for Nevada, they don't actually have um, a county breakdown. But if you see here, the, the sort of um, measures are number of children in poverty. Um, I'm just going to re read down here. Children whose parents lack secure uh, employment. Children living in households with a high uh, housing cost burden. Teens not in school and not working. So those are kind of measures of economic well-being, but they're also measures of the degree to which parents can link their children to opportunity, right? And so that piece is kind of low in general here in Las Vegas, in, in Nevada. And then again, if you look at education, here you see young children, um, so these are preschoolers who are not in school, um, it's relatively high. Uh, fourth graders not proficient in reading, eighth graders not proficient in math, high school students not graduating on time. So what you're getting there is a, um, a reading of what happens when you have the situation above, right? So this is again another way of thinking about social networks is how is it that adults in a household are able to create um, uh, some escape velocity for kids, right? And so this is another way of thinking about it. So what I want to end with here is um, a little bit of a discussion about uh, what do we think about policy when we think about um, social networks, right? So if we think about enhancing social networks, what are we talking about? Are we talking about increasing uh, the number of people who are in church associations or religious associations or who are in advoca advocacy organizations, um, who are in big sister, you know, big brother organizations. One of the things I think we should be thinking about is how do we lever policy to increase the links between generations and make sure that we, there are no, the, the sort of missing links that we saw in the Bronx and the Harlem measures, that those are really shored up. And I think that is an important area for public policy to focus on when we're thinking about enhancing social, uh, en enhancing, um, social networks. The second area is links to the mainstream economy, right? So when you look at these measures, what you're seeing here is there are sort of broken links or uneven links to the mainstream economy. And again, I think that is an important dimension of social networks, and particularly mobility enhancing social networks. And I think that is another area where we can focus on, focus policy uh, specifically on increasing those links securely and making sure that they're sustainable links with the mainstream economy, both for children and for adults. So I would say that, you know, given Rob's fantastic presentation um, earlier, uh, Las Vegas in particular has a kind of profile where it is actually possible to think about creating and strengthening those inter and intragenerational links because you don't have a lot of the um, sort of spatial barriers that you'll have in other places. Um, and it's also an important place to think about how do you create uh, social networks that link people to the mainstream economy and given, you know, and really securely, so there's no food insecurity, et cetera, do that really securely because given the general diversity uh, here in Las Vegas, I think this is a place that could probably be one of the pioneers in figuring out how to create policy that really 
levers and enhances social networks. And so I just want to um, end by saying that I'm really excited about being here. I'm excited about the possibility of working on this topic here in particular. And I'm really excited about the possibility of working with my colleagues uh, here at Brookings Mountain West. So thank you very much. All right, thanks. Okay, now it's on, right? Yeah. Okay, thank you all for coming. Uh, thank you for the invitation to join you. This is very exciting for me, too. Uh, this is like a world's collide moment for me. I've been coming to UNLV for a couple of years now. I've had the privilege to be a, a visiting scholar here from the Brookings campus, or Brookings Mountain East, as you sometimes refer to it, out in D.C. <laughs> uh, <laughs> yeah, the, the other Brookings, you know. Um, and which has been, and I've formed some relationships with some of the scholars here, and obviously with Brookings Mountain West. Uh, I've also had the privilege of working with Camille uh, in her new project, which is one of the most exciting things that's happened at Brookings in the last few years, which is the Race, Prosperity, and Inclusion Initiative. And uh, then, lastly, I've been asked uh, to lead a new initiative at Brookings with support from Camille and others on the future of the middle class. Uh, and today, really, is about bringing all of those um, elements together. So it's hugely exciting for me personally to be here. Uh, I should say, for those who haven't heard me speak before, that there's a certain apology to be made, which is that I go around lecturing Americans about social class with this accent. <laughs> so, just get it out of the way. Yes, I'm British by background. I am now a US citizen. Some of you may have heard me in this hall. Actually, I pulled out my US passport to prove that I'd become a citizen just in time to vote in 2016. And part of my defense, as well as being a citizen, is that we know a lot about class where I come from. So I know a bit of what I speak. Um, uh, so the Future of the Middle Class Initiative, which um, is only been launched this year, uh, is still in the relatively early stages, but I can say a little bit about it. And the first thing is that uh, it's been motivated by the new president of Brookings, General John Allen, and our growing sense that the plight and the position of the American middle class is a huge issue for us as a nation, but also a huge issue potentially for the world because the geopolitics of the world now mean that if you have a group that is suffering or feels like it's being left behind, being forgotten, that can have consequences for how people vote in terms of trade policy, immigration policy, and so on. And so this is, and I'll come on to that um, briefly. We've decided to um, focus for the first couple of years at least on four themes, two of which you've already heard about and one of which I'm about to talk about. The first is the issue of relationships or relational equality. And by that, we're talking about the social capital that Camille just talked about, but also about respect, M mutual respect across race and class lines. A, a truly equal society is one where we can all look each other squarely in the eye. And in that relational equality, I think we find a lot of the substance that underpins the other kinds of equality that we need. Without relational equality, without equality of respect, it's very hard to get the other kinds of equality that we're interested in, equality of resources and rights. That's one. The second theme is automation, the impact of automation. I won't say any more about that, except to note that my room service at the hotel I stayed in was by robot, <laughs> that I was actually able to order something using, a, 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 obviously it's fun, it's, you know, it's partly a gimmick, but I was able to kind of press a, a button on my uh, the pad, keypad in my room, and a robot turned up with my order. Um, so I don't think anything is going to be immune. So we're doing it uh, to potential threats from automation and potential opportunities from automation. The third theme I will talk about today is skills, with a particular focus on post-secondary skill acquisition, including two-year and access and uh, high public access four years. It doesn't have to be four-year, but it's quite clear that sustaining a middle-class income and a middle-class lifestyle requires, increasingly requires, quality post-secondary education, and so the affordability and access of post-secondary education will be a huge issue for us. And then fourthly, housing, uh, which Rob has already talked a bit about. Uh, and that strand of work will be led by a colleague from the Metropolitan Policy Program, Jenny Schutz, um, starting in January, and thinking about the affordability and access 
uh, to housing for, in particular, for the middle class. So those are the themes that we're going to be focusing on more broadly, but um, we're also going to be partnering uh, with uh, a metro. Today announces the uh, engagement between the main Brookings project and Brookings Mountain West to make Vegas somewhere we think about the middle class. The middle class is created, sustained, and strengthened in place. The evidence that place matters causally for mobility and for middle class outcomes is growing by the day. And many of the policy levers that we're interested in will be at a metropolitan level. And so the extent to which metros are middle class makers is a hugely important issue for us going forward. This is not something that can generally be done from a federal level, drop down on high. This is making and sustaining the middle class is done in the thick of daily life and it's done in metro, metro areas. And so it's with great pleasure that we've announced this partnership where we'll be looking at some of those themes with a specific focus um, at Las Vegas. We also hope to have a state partner, but we haven't quite announced that yet. So what I'm going to focus on today is um, skills, but I'm just going to very quickly go through the motivation for the project generally. Who are the middle class? Why do we care? Why are we worried about them? How education can be a great equalizer? How education can be a great stratifier? What that means for access and outcomes? And then how colleges can serve and build the middle class in Las Vegas. I'm going to try and do this with apologies reasonably quickly because uh, I want to leave some time for Q&A. So we're running a little bit behind, so I'll, I'll do this fast. Well, the first thing to note is that there seem to be as many definitions of the middle class in the US as there are people claiming to be middle class <laughs> in the US. So I'm a recovering European on this question, still struggling. And so this is from a paper that I wrote with a colleague, Katie Gio, and simply just giving you a sense of there are lots of different ways, even just if you're defining it by income, to define the middle class. So if you read a newspaper report which says middle class X, middle class shrinking in, middle class hollowing out, always, always figure out what definition they've used because the definitions vary quite significantly and have non-trivial effects on the result um, when you think about the middle class. We've been talking about this a lot. Camille is on our steering group, so she's been through too many discussions about how to define the middle class. I apologize in advance. Um, what we've decided to do is to define the middle class as the middle 60% of the income distribution. So not the bottom 20%, those, those who are definitely below the kind of federal poverty line, the bottom quintile, and not the top quintile, the top 20%, who as we'll see are doing kind of pretty well, but the middle 60%. It's a relative definition of the middle class. We'll always have 60% of the population in the middle 60%. I see that as a feature rather than a bug because it means we can look at how that middle 60% is doing. So this is kind of what this means. Right now for a, a family of three, it's kind of... It's a bit it's higher now, but it's 40-something uh, annual income up to 140-something annual income is the group that we're primarily interested in. To be discussed, if you wish. Uh, where do they live? This is work from Alan Barubi, uh, just published on our website, which actually takes that 60% definition, adjusts for the uh, cost of living in different cities, and then says, where are the middle class? So in other words, which cities have more of that group, the middle 60, in them? Uh, and this is the result, and you can see, and I'll show a bit more about this, that um, Las Vegas is one of the cities that has a higher percentage of its population coming from that middle 60 than many other cities do. So the distribution here is relatively tight by comparison to other cities. Why are we worried about them? Why are we so worried about the middle class the middle 60? Well, uh, this has just been updated for more recent figures. This is a slightly different data set to the one Camille showed you, but it has the same picture. This is showing you real income growth for three different groups uh, back since 79, based in 79. Um, and the orange line is the top 20%. The dark blue line is the bottom 20%. And the light blue line is the middle 60%. I should say that this takes into account the value of certain government transfers, of certain government services, not least health care, which is one of the things that's kind of driving up the bottom 20% figure. So I'm just going to be hands above the table about that, and we can have a long argument about whether that's the right measure. Um, CBO just yesterday updated this, um, so, but the trend is exactly the same. And so you're just sort of seeing in terms of how people are doing, that middle 60% is lagging both behind the top 20% and the bottom 20%. On a global level, that matters. This is something, so the elephant in the room, this is called the elephant chart. Some of you may have seen this, which takes the entire global income distribution, so from the poorest people in the world to the richest people in the world. This is the whole globe now. And then we look at real income growth um, between 88 and 2008. So it doesn't include the recession, it runs up to the recession. 
um, for the people at these different points in the global income distribution. It's called the elephant chart for obvious reasons. See the elephant? Right, good. Sometimes you actually have to superimpose an elephant on top just to make it clear. Um, but this is basically telling us, is, does this have a clicker? Oh, it does. Basically telling us, and there is some argument about this, including from Homi Karas at Brookings, as to whether this slightly overstates the story, but no one thinks the story isn't right, which is that the global middle class have seen huge income growth in recent decades. This is essentially the Chinese middle class. So think, think here about the massive increases you've seen there. Uh, not such fast growth for the global poor, although it's really hard to get good data for those countries, of course. Very low income growth for the people up here. This is essentially the Western middle and working class. Those who are in the kind of bottom 60, 70 percent, 80 percent of Western countries, including the US, very low income growth. And then up here, the richest in the world have been doing well regardless of where they live. Right? So one of the reasons we're worried about what's happening to the US middle class or the British middle class or Western European middle class is because it's not as if this is a zero sum game. But it's possible to make an argument that, look, that all of this global trade has created fantastic economic growth for people living elsewhere, but not such great economic growth for the middle class closer to home. And you can imagine what the political implications of such an argument could be. In fact, you don't have to imagine it. We're living it. <laughs> um, so it has global geopolitical consequences. Now, I'm going to talk about education briefly, and there will be more work coming on this. Some of this summarizes work I've done before and some of it anticipates some work I'm in the process of doing. Which is, first of all, to say that the idea of education, in particular post-secondary education as the great equalizer, is a hugely important part of the American story. Horace Mann, education is the great equalizer, the balance wheel in our social machinery. And, it, and, and so it is. This chart takes a little bit of unpacking. This is based from Raj Chetty's work using IRS data. But what this is telling me is the parents' income rank from, so I know what your parents' income is, from the poorest to the richest over here, I know what your income is, and poorest to the richest up the left-hand axis. The gray dots show me the relationship between the two for the whole population. Huge relationship between how rich your parents were and where you end up on the income distribution. But these are the lines I want to focus your attention on, which I'm apologies, the labels come off. These are the lines for the people who attend elite four-year colleges at the top, four-year colleges, oh no, they are still there, I'm sorry, and then two-year colleges. Now, the fact that the lines are quite high at least the here, tells us that getting four-year, and especially an elite four-year qualification, significantly pushes you up the income distribution. You're going to do better. We know that. We know there are returns. And the same for two-year, to a somewhat lesser extent. The fact that the lines are flat, or almost flat, tells me that even if you're from a poor background, say up down here, roughly this is roughly the federal poverty line, conditional on going to and through one of these educational institutions, your outcome's not very different to a rich kid who went to one of those institutions. So conditional on going to and through, post-secondary education is the great leveler, the great equalizer. That's the good news. Um, I've just put up this chart on community colleges because I want to focus on the fact that the two-year line is lower. OK, it's obvious. But if we just briefly look at who two years are serving, you want to talk about first gen, uh, parents who didn't finish high school, these are proportions of those in these categories that go to a, a two-year versus a four-year. So if neither of your parents finished high school, then if you go, you're going to go to, much more likely to go to community college. So they are serving, by definition, uh, because their access institutions are different groups. Now for the bad news. I've shown that conditional on going to and through, edu through these educational institutions is a great equalizer. Here's the problem. Same data set. Parents' income rank along the bottom, from the richest to the poorest to the richest parents. Left-hand axis, the percent of kids from those households attending college between the ages of 18 and 21. So you know how sometimes social scientists put up one of those scatter plots with dots everywhere, and then they put a line through it, and you're, you're squinting at it, saying, really? Is that really significant? Well, they have put the red line here, just as a courtesy, but I think you'll agree we don't need it. Um, and this here tells me, I've got 0.67 correlation, that I can predict your chances of going to college between 18 and 21 just by knowing your parents' income with two-thirds accuracy. I don't need to know your GPA. I don't need to know where, you're, where you live, where you school, what your race is. I don't need to know. Just tell me how much money your parents have got. And with two-thirds accuracy, I can predict whether you go to college in those years, not mature students. Big caveat. So great equalizer, in theory, 
to and through. Trouble is, there are so few kids from poor backgrounds going to and through, especially elite institutions. Where do the middle class go to college? So this is stuff that we're still working on. You can see, look, there's a little bit of a glitch there. Um, lowest quintile, bottom 20%, top 20% of those who go to college. Right, I'm just showing you that a lot don't go. Of those who go, the modal institution for the middle 60 is a two-year institution, followed closely by a public four-year described in the data as non-elite. So a, public, a more public access four-year. That's where they go to college. Meanwhile, the people over here who, who dominate the news, they're the ones going to elite four years, et cetera, and not going to two years. So that's where the middle class go, and then obviously lowest quintile even more. That's why access matters, but also outcomes matter too. So I'm going to give you an example of uh, historically black colleges. Historically black colleges are very good mobility enhancers. They have fantastic results, but they do so primarily because of their access. So what this shows you is for all colleges and universities and HBCUs, what percentage of their students come from, now I'm going to look at the bottom quintile, what percentage come from the bottom quintile, and then of those who come from the bottom quintile, how many make it to the top quintile? So that's a very radical mobility measure, but it makes the point. And the point is that if you're in a non-HBC university, you can say, look, our out the outcomes we have for poor kids are better than the HBCU outcomes for poor kids, missing out the fact that they don't take that many poor kids by comparison to HBCUs, which is almost certainly having an effect on the data. So it's a combination of both access and outcomes that drives mobility. And that is too often lost in the story. Lastly, how can colleges, this is just the beginning of this piece of work, um, how can colleges serve and build the middle class in Vegas? Well, let's show some data, some of this I've shown before, which is now by the parents' income quintile, what does the composition of different institutions look like in terms of what students go to these colleges? So let's start here with UNLV where we get, get a pretty good sense of it. And you're kind of seeing you know, non-trivial numbers from the, 60, from the middle 60 here. Reno, by comparison, nearly half their students come from the top 20% of the income distribution, many fewer from the middle 60, and, and similarly from the bottom. And then you've got College of Southern Nevada and Nevada State College, which actually they are taking somewhat more from these lower income quintiles, but not so dramatically different to the four-year in UNLV as you would see in other cities. So these are high access institutions we're looking at here on the left-hand side of this chart. Now, what are the outcomes? Well, the individual income for someone who comes, graduates from UNLV is 41,000, 41,500, and from Reno, it's 45,000. So they're doing better, at least as far as it looks for now. And I presented some of this earlier. But this is the household income of where the students come from. And so, when I look at the gap, but when I'm looking at what's happening here, what we're interested in what institutions do is taking kids from middle class or poorer backgrounds and giving them middle class futures. And in terms of the translation, UNLV looks quite good, at least on this measure. Just, I'm not going to go into this, but uh, this is the same for uh, a bunch of Mountain West institutions. And again, just to kind of make the point that you're going to be looking at, so Colorado State, yes, 45,000 outcome for the kids, but look at the median incomes to the parents. Okay. So you want to be what we want to be looking at here is the extent to which you're kind of getting decent outcomes here, even from relatively modest inputs here. That's what we're interested in, translation. Okay. So having gone through all this, our next step is going to be to examine the trends in socioeconomic and racial composition of Vegas colleges, so more of what you just saw. Um, I want to develop a new measure for colleges as a middle class makers. So not just this bottom to top quintile, but think about middle quintiles um, using new opportunity insights data, some of which I showed before. Look at policy options, um, have a paper, hopefully an event in March, um, as well as work on social capital and housing. And so just to add to Robin um, Bill's call, please, please get involved. And thank you for your attention. Now we'll switch to the panel. Before I ask each of you about your own papers, I, I'd like to ask you a, a little different question, and that is, you just saw two presentations by two colleagues. Was there a, an aha moment in one of those where you 
saw something new or different or something that affirmed something you'd been thinking about a lot, or sort of a takeaway you got from either of your colleagues? Anyone care to jump, jump in first? Uh, well, you know, the, the state's been emphasizing the growth of higher education. We have a system office that's been bad mouthing UNLV, saying we're not succeeding, throwing our president out, who now is the president at Claremont Graduate School. And then I see data like this. And I want to know, who's yelling at you and all? Because they need a good yelling. <laughs> you see those Mountain West schools? Consider where we were. We're at the lower end in terms of the input, and we're in the middle in terms of the output. It's not what you get out, it's what you put in. If you go and cream all the upper middle class kids out of all Southern Nevada, and then hand them a credential where at 34, if they married somebody of equal credential, they wouldn't match their parents' income, is not a success. Handing somebody a credential and having them, if they married and found somebody of equal credential, and at age 34, in their mid-30s, passed their parents' income, that would seem something more reliably uh, reproducing the middle class in that sense. And UNLV is doing that, and we hear nothing about that from this state. Nothing. What we hear is we don't graduate enough. Well, I'll tell you what. You look at the input. What do you think the graduation rate's going to hmm. be? What we're doing is we're an access institution that is accepting people who have all kinds of other things in their life that cause distress, that makes it difficult for completion. We're doing our best, but we can't be compared to the flagship school. What a weak flagship, flagship school we have. You know, let's, come, let's put Rutgers University up there and see what you get out of that flagship. We're being compared, and yet there really isn't any comparison. UNLV is better at being UNLV than UNR is at being UNR, and that's empirically true, and it's demonstrable through that. So what I see, what comes to me out of this data, is that if you're gonna create a mechanism for upper middle class mobility within this state, put more into UNLV because it's more reliable at delivering on that promise. Would you care to follow that community? <laughs> well, <laughs> well, welcome to UNLV. Yes. So, of course, I'm going to say something about UNLV, but I think, uh, you know, Rob has put it very nicely, but I, I, it's very, very clear that UNLV is very important in shifting um, the curve that we saw that linked parents' income to, you know, actually going to college, right? And so I think it's clear that UNLV plays a very important uh, role here in, in Las Vegas. The other thing that I wanted to, to mention is um, in Rob's presentation, I really thought the um, slides and discussion on mixed income neighborhoods uh, in Las Vegas and sort of the history of that, I think was very, very interesting. And um, I think it also, uh, May, means that there are there's a lot of potential for policy that uh, can end in upward economic mobility. So I, I'm I'm actually very encouraged by that. Hmm. So I was struck by in Camille's presentation. It's clear that when we talk about social networks or mobility enhancing social networks, which is a phrase I love, it's just incredibly hard to measure. I was really struck by the attempt that those scholars um, you mentioned had had made to kind of get at it indirectly in a sense, right. which is because it's just so hard to measure directly, are there proxies for it, such as you know, the things you mentioned, incarceration, um, foster. So it's just a, a reminder that whilst it, we know how important these networks are, they're just incredibly difficult to measure. I do just want to say something in response to Rob, though, because I don't want to be misunderstood here. I am not saying by any means <laughs> that completion doesn't matter, or that in mm -hmm. any way we should be letting up the pressure on completion. All I'm doing is I'm saying that there is a balance to be struck between who you're serving and what the odds of completion are. And that you need to put both of those factors into the equation if you're fairly to judge an institution. So no one's going to be happy if we just have this completely open access institution that graduates 5% of its people mm -hmm. with a worthless qualification, right? And so I do want to kind of just 
make sure that that is clear, <laughs> that I'm in no way trying to take the pressure off around completion. I'm just saying it's a trade-off. And if you're interested in the overall numbers of people you're trying to help, don't forget the access piece as well as the outcome piece. It's dead easy to have good outcomes, if, as, as you say, mm. um, if you just let in only a very handful of, handful of people. And the last thing is, this is Sarah Goldrick, Goldrick Rabb's phrase. She's a scholar in college. She says, actually, public access institutions need to stop talking about having college-ready students. And instead, what we need is student-ready colleges. And the more open access you are, the more you need to be a student-ready college. The idea that people are just going to write pre-packaged, ready to go, ready to learn, good, you know, et cetera, is for the birds or for the elite colleges. Mm -hmm. And so actually being a student-ready mm -hmm. institution is something I think needs to be put alongside the emphasis on whether or the individualized emphasis on college-ready students for all the reasons that we put. Let me just add that. one thing regarding that. Uh, what I'm referring to about completion, yeah, Completion is necessary or you don't achieve the goals that you're, you're right. after. Right. But we're talking about comparison to relevant peers. And we're going to do a piece that finds our peers as the diverse institutions that you find in comparable sized metropolitan areas. And among that group, we don't perform poorly. We don't, we're not at the top, we're not at the bottom. And what I meant by you and R in that regard is that Y uh, we can't be compared to UNR's completion rates. Compare UNR's completion rates to the University of Oregon. Compare the University of Connecticut to similar sized states into right. their so-called flagships. And in that, they're not performing very well. Nor are they performing well in R&D, I might add, either. <laughs> in that they're the only institution between a state two and four million that is the flagship that is not a Carnegie R1 institution. So they are flat out dead last in that regard. So they're not just failing in terms of their ability to deliver a completion. We, on the other hand, look more mixed. You know, I wouldn't put us at the top of the pack. You know, I mentioned Rutgers Newark as, an, as a diverse institution that, uh, you know, that matched us in that regard. They're doing better. New Jersey does better in terms of delivering that. So as a state, we're failing, and it's reflected in the two leading four-year institutions within the state. But among those two four-year institutions, I wouldn't put all the, you know, the focus on the dysfunction at UNLV and never even mention UNR in that regard. UNR needs to be a lot better flagship institution, so-called. And we need to be matched against the university you know, that you'd find in every big city. So we're, we're not University of Central Florida, which is excelling as an access plus mm. oh, yeah. you know, leading research mm -hmm. R&D institution, and Orlando's a comparable size city. We don't look unlike Portland State. We don't look like Cle unlike Cleveland State. We don't look like the University of Missouri at St. Louis or Kansas City, which are the actual true peers to our institution. So what we're gonna do is we're gonna come out with a report that matches us against true peers. And in that report, completion matters, as it always does. R&D matters, of course, as it does, because R&D's capacity within a region lifts all boats. If you've got more you know, R&D and you've got companies connected to that, that's the ladder of mobility for people who receive advanced credentials in particular. So you know, all of that's in the mix, so I don't mean to shortchange it, but I just want to note that's a metric that this system, this talk's never been given to the system office. This, as far as I know, the system office doesn't know anything about this. This is a talk that needs to be given to the system office, and both schools ought to be held to account on. Let me get a little nerdy here. Try not, try not to go too deep, but start with you, Richard, since you just spoke. Uh, student debt's a big issue nationally. People worried about that. Nevada actually has a relatively low amount of student debt. I think it's just over $14,000 would be the, the average. Only two other states are lower than that. Uh, the state is trying to put more money into scholarships and getting students into the institutions. Will that help? Um, yes, it will help. We should be making sure that the price of less public investment in four years is not higher costs for the students attending. Um, I will say that there's a distinction between the real economic barrier, the economic costs of college versus the returns, the benefits of going to college against the perceived ones. And I'm somewhat concerned now that the debate about student debt and is college worth it um, and a lot of the stories that go around of these people you know, with huge debts and so on actually is missing the mark in terms of the experience for most students. So there are people with huge amounts of debt who went to elite colleges who are going to be fine. I do not care about the person with $100,000 of debt because they got a PhD from Georgetown. I really don't care about that. 
but that will grab the headlines. Mm. Um, <laughs> the mm. people who I'm most, and, and I, uh, I'm not so worried about the person that gets decent in-state tuition amount, you know, decent subsidized mm. loan, and goes on to get a decently paid job that allows them to pay that loan back. The other end of the spectrum, and where the real debt problem is, is the people who get, in some cases, missold a private, for-profit education at great expense and for little reward. And they may not end up with the m huge six-figure amounts of debt, but the default rates are highest for those with the lowest levels of debt. Because they went to a for-profit institution, who are the only ones taking more from the bottom 20% across the whole system, and ended up not graduating with a worth or with a almost worthless credential, very expensive debt because it's not properly subsidized and in real trouble. And so the for-profit sector is a huge problem in higher education in the US. And one of the first things that the new administration did was to undo the steps that President Obama had started to make to regulate the for-profit sector in college education. We are building a new subprime market by selling and mis-selling uh, debt for worthless uh, uh, educations in for-profit colleges. The problem is not, by and large, in public four-year colleges. Not to minimize it, but I don't want people to get the message, oh, is college worth it? Because in a public four-year, you bet it is. For the vast majority of people, you bet it is. So the scare story is worrying. Camille, let me ask a question and see if I understood. One of your data points was, was the growing poverty line mm -hmm. in Las Vegas, mm -hmm. and it was on a fairly consistent trajectory, mm -hmm. even through the Great Recession. Mm -hmm. And we were ground zero for the Great Recession among right. American cities, highest foreclosure rate, highest unemployment rate. The, the recession didn't super increase unemployment and, and right. those kind of factors. Uh, is there an explanation for that? It, we, I'll let you try that. Well, no, I mean, that's, that's, that's interesting. And, and it's true that you didn't get uh, like a big spike up there. But what I think is interesting about that data is you also didn't get a slope downward after the recession ended. So to some degree, what you're seeing, you might be seeing a persistence based on what happened during the reception, recession. And what I, what the most important point of that is that the economy is doing really well now. And we're still, that, that trajectory is actually, was moving mm -hmm. upward. And the mismatch between the national economy and that level, I think, is really mm -hmm. worrying. I mean, and, and that's the main thing. So, you know, if you relate that to economic mobility, what that means is, you know, large chunks of the, you know, population here in Clark County are really imperiled in their ability uh, to move up uh, economically. Okay. You invited us to be nerdy, so I'll just uh, add a nerdy point to that, which um, <laughs> Cam Camille's chart was showing the number of people right. uh, who are poor. Uh, I think to kind of illustrate the fact that just the, the sheer number of people right. who are poor, um, rather than the rate of poverty. Yeah. Right. And no, so no. one potential explanation for why you didn't see that recession effect is that maybe population growth slowed oh, right. with less right. immigration. Right. And so, mm -hmm. um, so y you know, we could overlay mm -hmm. the rate. Right against population growth. Um, it doesn't in any way take away from the point that there is X number of poor people here now, but it means that in trying to interpret it against the economic cycle, we probably want to look at the rate as well. Yeah, of course, yeah. yeah. Thank you. Uh, well, we just had an election, Rob, mm -hmm. uh, and we mentioned our colleague Bill Fry at Brookings. Mm -hmm. He's, like a lot of us, he's pouring through the data and the numbers. One of, I saw one of his first reports which suggested that nationally it was young voters female voters, well-educated female voters that made a difference. We saw, of course, the House mm -hmm. flip, which is traditional during a midterm election. Mm -hmm. uh, we saw in Nevada a, a flip, if mm -hmm. you will, uh, at state, among statewide offices, a number of women elected. We now have two mm -hmm. female U U.S. senators. Uh, a a, a middle-class effect there? Uh, you know, the middle class, the threat to the middle class, of course, and Richard alluded to this earlier, drove national politics in 16, certainly, because the case was made. And there's parts of the country where you see this effect greater. I mean, look, one of the reasons you might not have as much anger in Las Vegas is, look at the data Richard just presented. The percentage in the, in the range in Vegas is higher than you'd guess. Mm -hmm. Vegas is an interesting case where you have really high chronic poverty numbers. 
and you also have a substantial middle class. Mm -hmm. And so if you know, the, the focal point of American politics pivoted on the 16 anger, and I guess still residually there, even though we were in an economic growth phase, still residually there from you know, the earlier part of the decade with deep recession, and still sort of volatile that way, you know, it explains perhaps why Las Vegas might not be you know, high on the anger list as far as places. There, it's a successful region. It has problems born of the success, and there are deficits long-standing that despite the success haven't, be haven't been addressed, which is worrisome. In other words, there hasn't been the kind of public investment in some of the capacity in the regional outputs, you know, the regional inputs, I should say, like, like education K through 12 or higher ed, that you would need to sustain the trajectory of growth that we're on with the middle class. We've lived like Blanche Dubois on the kindness of strangers. Hmm. Our middle class is because those schools are so damn good in California. And then the Californians look at the position that that state sees in terms of costs, mm -hmm. in terms of barrier of entry for housing and so on, and they look to a neighbor like Las Vegas, which they believe is a culturally kin city now. It's a kind of progressive place. And they come and they might not you know, want higher taxes and they might not, you know, they might love the fact that we've got lower cost housing, but they end up coming with a, a value system that matches California and sort of makes the politics of this state increasingly cal like California, which of course wound up in the national discussion when people came out and warned against, my God, what if you become East California? We should be so lucky. <laughs> I want to get to the audience because we're running out of time and my colleague, Caitlin Saladino, has a microphone so we can get your question. Uh, she'll be walking around. I think she's gonna come over here first. If there's anyone from Maine who would like to chastise Rob for his <laughs> cruel remarks. I love you. You're gonna watch this from Maine. <laughs> yes, sir. It's gonna go viral in Maine. Hi, I'm Ruben Garcia. I'm on the faculty of the law school here, and I think this is a great project, and I certainly think there are a lot of aspects um, to study here, but one thing I didn't hear, partly because I uh, teach labor law and employment law, and I have done research on the effect of the culinary union here in terms of the middle class, in terms of social networks, um, in terms of citizenship and politics, uh, in terms of, of all of the things, again, the inputs into mm -hmm. the middle class that I think, and, and you know, again, we have the, the broader data, um, you know, nationally of uh, unionization declining and inequality going up. So I wonder if, uh, you know, when we, the, the input of wages, and again, uh, Dr. Reeves' data on basically, you know, the, the impact that parents' income has on, uh, you know, success, right? So, so all of those things are the inputs of wages, wage policy, uh, labor policy, and basically social uh, capital or social networks, uh, political networks within uh, labor, are, are they also going to be studied as part of this project? Well, we are the least educated middle class people in the United States. Mm -hmm. And one of the reasons for that is that when, you know, you used to be able in the 1950s to go to Detroit and get a middle class job because of unionism or steel mills in Pittsburgh, when all that faltered, one of the last great vehicles for upward mobility in the United States for a non-college graduate was the Las Vegas Strip because it was unionized successfully and culinary has a tremendous amount of power as exhibited in the last election, I might add. Mm -hmm. So what's interesting about Las Vegas is we have near middle of the U.S. in terms of median income, and we have a large middle class, as was depicted in the, in the graphic on the, on the U.S. map. And at the same time, we have Mississippi and Arkansas education attainment levels. We have Mississippi ec education profile with something more like a Kansas outcome in terms of median household income, and that's do, I would say, mostly attributable to the fact that the dominant industry is tourism, and that tourism has been successful for the workers for having been unionized. No, I'd make a more general point. I'd take a step back and think about power in the labor market generally. So wage growth is lagging economic growth. A big part of the inequality story is a wage inequality story. Mm -hmm. um, that's very clear. Even now we're seeing it's wages are not moving as quickly as we would expect economically. Um, and I think that's really about power. Um, trade unions were one way that workers could exercise power. Of course, we're down to single digits now in the private sector who are unionized. 
Um, another way to have workers to have power is to run a full employment economy, is to run the, run the macro economy hotter, which I think there is a very strong case for. One of the arguments some people make, even for something like universal basic income, is that it would, it would improve the negotiating position of mm -hmm. workers because they'd be able to say, I don't have to work, so you better make it worth my while. And those are, I think, all very different ways of getting at the same problem, which is restoring the power imbalance in the labour market. My own view is a very long road to thinking that unions are going to be the primary way to do that. But in the meantime, there are certainly things we can do about how hot we're, run how hot we're running the economy. I think we're too worried of inflation right now. Don't want to get into macroeconomics. <laughs> um, and maybe thinking of other ways, too, that we can just give workers more rights, um, even absent more unionization, to try and change that power dynamic. There's clearly an imbalance of power. I'm just not quite sure yet how big a part unions will play in redressing it. And I just wanted to add one other thing to that, too, which is that, you know, um, in general, as the national economy is changing and you do see this imbalance in power, I think one of the inter interesting questions is um, with increased automization, um, who is it that actually defines what skills are necessary, how uh, employees mm. um, relate to employers, um, and those are kind. Those are kinds of questions that, if we, you know, continue on the trajectory they're on now, will make it very difficult to re to, to rewrite that balance. I think, and it'll be interesting to see how that happens here in Las Vegas, which is one of the last strongholds for unions. I think there was a question over here. Meaningful completion rate should be the issue, not just completion rate. I, I, I was a professor at Ohio State at one time, and they had open enrollment, but at the same time, they failed about half of the students, <laughs> and they didn't have any problems with it. And I think, I don't know if that's still their policy, you know, but when I was there um, professing, that's what, what happened. Uh, so, I mean, I, I don't think that's an indica a, a positive indicator, completion rate. I think completion rate with <laughs> good skills and ability to write well and all that kind of stuff, that's meaningful. <laughs> so just wanted to say that. Well, I remember undergrad, and they'd say, you know, I started undergrad, I'll date myself in 1977, at the Maine State University in New Jersey. He said, look left, look right, when you won't be here next year. And I thought, well, it's the <laughs> other guy. I'm going to still be around. Uh, the old pattern before U.S. News and World Report distorted the system and created what I call the cult of completion was that state universities like Cal Berkeley would let you in sink or swim. They were open to access, they'd give you a swing at it. They knew there weren't going to be as many seniors as freshmen. They understood that dynamic. And then what happened is U.S. News and World Report favored uh, completion and private schools want you to complete because they need your money for donations later on. They need you to be a rich alumni and put more money back in. Their business model required your successful completion and then your loyalty as an alum to the institution where the state was providing the majority of resources, especially in the late 1970s, to state universities so they could afford to say to you, it's a privilege to be here. We're going to test you. You might be one of the kids who works out. And you know, you get it. And the, the fact is now, if you look at California, it is so underproduced higher education opportunity. It's so restrained. It, only Channel Islands has been added in the CSU system, you know, only Merced in the UC system. You got now acceptance rates to Cal State Long Beach at 30 percent. Yeah, actually, if you look at Las Vegas going forward and you don't allow us to build more buildings and let more students in, we're going to have completion, we're going to have acceptance rates like that. We're, like San Diego State is 30 percent. It's that there's only one San Diego State. So, you, it used to be that they were, and by the contrast, ASU has built enough space to, and ASU isn't obsessed about completion rates quite the same way. It's obsessed about, did you include somebody who, if they had a bite at the apple, might be okay with it? So it's a mix. I mean, I, I, it's a failure to have a dramatically low completion rate. It's a waste, and somebody then is encumbered in debt. The worst thing is you paid for an expensive education, didn't complete, and now you owe the debt on it, and you don't have the credential, so you're not conferred the benefits of the credential. So I'd like to see more people complete, but at the same time, no way am I like the way the system office is on completion rates, because I know the history of it, and I know the cult of it, 
And I know that all these public institutions have been driven to create more completion like UC Chapel Hill, UNC Chapel Hill and Rutgers and so on because the private schools are all ranked higher in US News and World Report because they focused on a quality that was an elite quality of institution. I want to be respectful of people's time, so I know we've run over a little bit. Uh, our colleagues will be around if you have a question we haven't had time to incorporate into the public part of our program. I want to thank you all again for coming and helping us launch this event. A special thanks to my colleagues for their presentations today and getting us off to such an impressive start. So please uh, follow us, stay in touch with us because uh, we've only begun to address the issues and topics we discussed today. Th thank you. That's one of the main four themes. Yeah. That's one of the four major themes of the project. Yeah. Yeah. I just mm -hmm. want to say, if you are a student right now, probably better to complete. <laughs> <laughs> I think that's right. I, I agree. Uh, risk. <laughs> but if you're an institution right now, <laughs> better to take a chance on somebody who shows promise and may not sure. complete than to exclude them with the idea that their non-completion will affect your students' yes, support. Yes, that, that we agree on. Yeah. But completion does matter. Right. <laughs> Thank <laughs> you.